When Ernst Pucke was at high school, he was told by one of the teachers that he was useless, that he was a good-for-nothing Māori boy. He'd never amount to anything. He was told he'd never hold down a job, and like all the other useless Māori, he'd probably end up in prison. Well, actually, in one way, his teacher was right. He did end up in prison. He's been working with the Department of Corrections for over 25 years, doing some amazing mahi, encouraging the inmates that he works with to be the best versions of themselves. Ants, kia ora. Thank you so much for joining us. Kia Andrew. Uh, take us back to that, that young boy in high school. Did you have hopes and dreams for the future? What did you want to be when you were younger? Um, I, I don't know, to be honest. Um, I was just trying to make my way through life. I, I didn't inspire to be anything. But the words spoken over my life had an impact on me. And I guess my rebellious nature was to prove them wrong. Um, and where I sit today, I'm a, I'm a qualified joiner. Mm-hmm. Um, I get to work with some amazing people. And uh, um, I get to serve an amazing God. And, and that's why I'm here to talk to you today, mm. Andrew. Talk to us about your family life, your childhood. Um, what was that like, Ant? Well, I had two super amazing parents. Um, both of them gone to be with the Lord now. Mm-hmm. Um, they role modelled to me what it is to be a man. To They role modelled to me what resilience looks like. And we, we didn't grow up in a palace. Um, in fact, I, I was a bit shy to invite my friends around to my house because, uh, uh, you know, it, it is what it is. Yeah. But my mum and dad had some great values. There was always kai on the table. And I knew what love looked like, Andrew. Mm. And love is not a... Uh, A word, it's an action. Mm -hmm. And uh, I grew up with the understanding of I love you, son, was just the normal. And I didn't understand that that's foreign in a lot of young people's lives, even today. Was faith a part of your upbringing? It was. Mm -hmm. Um, My nan and my koko have gone to be with the Lord many years ago. They planted a seed. So all their mokopuna would come around and, and we used to top and toe in the lounge and we used to love it, seeing all our yeah. cousins. And, and my nan and my kuro would lay their hands and pray over us. And we would recite the prayer also. And I guess at that time, I, I didn't know how powerful that prayer was. Um, and that seed that was planted has blossomed. Mm. And I said, there's still a lot to work to, to do. <laughs> you know? Certainly. Uh, now, in terms of your own faith journey, your uh, decision to follow Jesus, how did, how did that come about, Anne? Well, um, I was a little bit rebellious and I, I enjoyed the, the motorbikes and the long hair, a little bit longer than yours, Andrew. <laughs> um, and I had all the skull rings and, and all that. And I had a motorbike accident. And while I was in hospital recovering, my foreman, where I used to work as a joiner, um, prayed over me and asked if I'd like to come to a Sunday service. Well. Wow. My, my heart said no, but my voice said yes. And I found out about a, a Jesus and a God that loved me for who I am. Mm. And, he, and, he, and he knew me and the intimate relationship and I, the purity of love and hope. And it's, it's just beautiful. And um, that was in the mid-90s and I'm still walking in faith today. Mm. And putting that faith, hope and love into action in the work that you do in prisons, uh, taking the light of Jesus into some pretty dark situations. What's there a sense of, of God's calling in terms of the work you do? I, as you said, trained as a joiner, but now doing that work within the prisons. What led you there, Ants? A desire for a want for more than I could perceive. So uh, as a young man... Um, I just offered up and I said, Lord, if, if this is part of your plan for me, I believe you open the doors for me. If it's not, the doors won't open. Not only did he open the doors, but he continued to open those doors and far and wide. And I walked into the unknown and that was okay. Mm. All I needed to be was faithful and obedient. And I guess being obedient has been very hard over the years because there are many challenges yeah. And in, with the people we work with and the people in my own community. Tell us more specifically about the, the sort of work that you're involved with, because it's, it's quite specialist uh, skills that you're doing. It's quite particular work you're doing with prisoners. 
uh, I tell everyone I'm the uh, number one pot washer, and I grab a mop and clean the whare paku. Um, Andrew, I, I'm no more special than anyone else in our field. Mm. I, I think the special thing is the, is the glory and the fire that I carry, and um, I'm a servant of the Most High. I suppose the, the question, uh, if I can re-ask that then, is you've got particular skills in joinery. Yeah. God is using those joinery skills within the prison environment. That's right. Um, I started off as a joinery instructor, and I tutored there for about 13 years. Um, opportunity arose for me to to jump to this next level, and I've taken up the position as a principal instructor. Mm -hmm. So I oversee the trade areas, and um, so we have... Many prisoners coming into our areas uh, wanting to learn a new skill. Um, the easy part is, I think at the moment, our country is short out there with skilled trades people. So to feed into that is an easy part. To speak into that is just what comes natural. Um, to hear the heartache and to understand it are two different things, I think, from my perspective, for the men I work with. Um, I love the fruit that you bear by being obedient to God, you know, because some of the stuff that I find hard to tackle, I battle on my knees. Yeah. That's where I battle. And, and I, I get frustrated just like, like any other man. But the purity of the fruit that comes is just such a joy. Some of the guys that you work with, are some of them from pretty tough backgrounds, I imagine, and perhaps they were told when they were young that they were no-hopers, that they would end up in prison. Those negative words were spoken over their lives. What's the difference between them and you, where they've ended up, where you've ended up? I don't think there is a difference in saying that. I think uh, for myself, faith have, has influenced me. Yep. Um, we're not determined by our background or our, our, our past. God knows our past and he wants us to move forward. My job is to uffy, is to support the men and have those opportunities. Because you know, big men will scribble over their face and for whatever reason in there, they hurt, yeah. they cry, they're lonely. There's a sense of hopelessness. I myself can't do anything. But when you walk in God's favor, I'm amazed the amount of doors that open. In the particular prison where I work, I'm not alone. There are men and women of faith that are there. And when we gather together, you know, the word says where two or three meet, yeah. I will be there, I'll turn up, and he always does. We pray for some outrageous things, and outrageous things happen. I say that because I serve a God, the God of the impossibles. Yeah. I serve a God, of the, he's the great I am. And after many years of walking in his favour, my vision hasn't changed. My vision hasn't changed today, Andrew. As I said, some of these guys would have had negative things spoken over their lives at a young age as well. What you had but they lacked, perhaps they didn't have a father that told them that mm. he loved them. That stable household environment, those, those positive male role models, from my understanding, those are, those are often missing in men who find themselves in prison. And that's correct. Um, when you journey with someone, you become their dad. Yeah. You can become the auntie, whatever you call it. I mean, for a man to journey with another man in life, uh, there's a recipe that has to happen. And part of that recipe is trust. Mm -hmm. And part of that re recipe is where we're going, the destination and, and, and what their needs are. Um, I guess I, I'm not a psychologist. Yeah. I, I don't have uh, all these tickets behind me. But what I do have is I was I brought up with a mum and dad that had faith mm -hmm. and I saw what love looked like and I can see the missing element. And, you know, some of the men that I, I work with, they don't want to hear that. Yeah. They don't want to hear all that lovey-dovey stuff. Mm. But um, you have to go in with a sharp sword <laughs> and not yeah. with cotton wool. Yeah. And... Um, and that's worked. As well as the work that you do, also, of course, a, a husband, father of uh, three teenage girls. That mm. sounds like a very busy household indeed. How do you teach love to your girls? Brother, they teach me love. Okay. Before I was married and before I had children, I read the Bible as a young man, and I thought, what is unconditional love? 
mm-hmm. and I couldn't comprehend what unconditional love. Then I had children. Yeah. And I thought, wow. I would walk on the roadside when we go walking. So if a car came and hit me, mm. I would bend over backwards. Our children, uh, Georgia, who is 18, mm-hmm. almost 45. Uh, <laughs> Brooke, who is uh, 16, 15, sorry. And yeah. baby Rachel, who's 14. Um, amazing girls. And my wife is an amazing, amazing woman. My wife is a assistant principal in Upper Hutt. Mm-hmm. And this morning... Um, She said, you can't just leave the house. I got up early this morning and she laid her hands and prayed Mm. over me. And that's part of our DNA, Andrew. That's not anything extra or special. That's just who we are. And to say, I love you lots on top of that. So in regards to um, love, my children have taught me how to love. Mm. I live with four women, my wife and my three girls. And uh, um, pretty hard to be a bloke sometimes. (laughs) But my boy is a pup. He's two years old and he's just beautiful and he's brought another sense of love into our whanau. Mm. But um, I've worked with the cards that I've dealt and I've worked with the blessing that God has given me. Yeah. Talk to us about the uh, praying together as husband and wife. That can be such a powerful thing, uh, regardless of what may else be happening in your life. If you know that somebody's got your back, that they're praying mm. for you, you're praying for them, that can make a huge difference in marriage in married life. Oh, Exactly, yes, yes, and I think that's where the power is when a husband and wife pray, and we do pray, but we don't pray enough. Mm-hmm. How much is enough? <laughs> How much is too little? Yeah. We, we often pray for a need. Uh, we're gap fillers. We will pray for uh, whanau or friends that aren't, aren't well. We, we pray for, for anything that God gives us on our plate. We pray over our fellowship. We pray for the Spirit of God to dwell amongst us. Um, we pray at our table, we pray it in our room, we pray in the car. Um, but it's our it's our corridor and our want and our desire and the fulfilment that comes from that. I imagine with the work that you do, I mean, talking about this home environment, you know, surrounded by by women and notice you're wearing a pink shirt today, bro. That's good on, good on yeah, you I know. for that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but. I imagine that in the work that you do, you need to be pretty strong. You're working with some guys from some pretty tough, some pretty staunch backgrounds. Uh, do you feel that you need to to be the tough guy in your work environment? I think if we turn that around, I think if I turn the tough guy into the real guy, because yep. the tough guy doesn't break through, mm-hmm. but the real guy does. Yeah. Anything I do, Andrew, uh, whether it's a meeting we have at work, whether it's a staff hui that we have, I commit it to prayer. Mm -hmm. I pray over my staff. I pray over our jail. I pray over our management team. Um, And to be real, you know, at the end of the day, they want to see someone that's real in in front of them. I mean, you've got a certain look, a certain physicality. Do you think that helps with the work you do? Um, Being uh, slim and blonde haired, yes, I think (laughs) I, I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. Um, I think the men, and myself included, want to see the heart. Yeah, yeah. You know, rather than hear about a Jesus in a book, see the Jesus in someone's life. As we were saying before, you have working with guys that haven't seen a lot of positive ro- male role models. How do they respond to you in the prison environment? Well, it's interesting. Some will just turn their back and walk away and with a, some words under their breath. Mm. And, you know, maybe it's an opportunity for me to shake the sand off my sandals and walk on. Yeah. It's not a no. It's just not yet. Yeah, yeah. You know, and my prayer is that, that the Holy Spirit will reach him and, and, and dreams and, you know, because that's amazing God we serve. Mm. When we look at incarceration rates for Māori in New Zealand compared to the rest of the population, there's some pretty shocking statistics. As a Māori, how does that make you feel? I think um, through the media, Andrew, it's easy to, to buy into that. What I'd like to return is that there are more Māoris that make a difference in the community. Yeah. There are more Māoris that raise beautiful whānau. Mm-hmm. Statistically, I should be inside. Yeah. But I've turned that around, and it's, and it's, it's hard work. But there are more Māoris that have professional jobs and stuff like that. So in regards to those statistics, um, I can only work with the men that are inside, that are, that are in front of me. Yeah. 
um, I'm not fluent in the reo, but I, I know enough to get out of trouble. <laughs> so sometimes to kōrero yeah. and to listen. And um, the difference sometimes is you may ask me what I do for a job. And in that, you'll figure out where I stand. Mm -hmm. I would ask the brother where he's from. Mm -hmm. And that, in my culture, um, has a status of where he's from. Yeah. Nga te parau. Oh. So half the staff I work with from Nga te parau. Yeah. Beautiful whānau. Um, why do, are we, do we have more Māori in, or in prison? I'm not too sure. Some people would see that the prison system is, is failing Māori. Uh, and there's all sorts of suggestions about what the causal factors are and uh, the solutions are even more complex than that. Do you have hope that we're at least heading in the right direction? Are there, are there good things starting to happen within the prison system? Good things happened 25 years ago, Andrew, when I walked into the job. Yeah. Okay. We have the philosophy in our uh, correction system called hokairangi, and we have values. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're on the walls and they're in the, in the emails that come through. But those values have always been with us. Mm. But it's, we put those values into action. Um, like I say, I, I'm very fortunate to work with amazing staff that share the same passion. And not all of those passionate people are Christians. Yeah. Well, not yet anyway. <laughs> so I've got a bit of work to do. Yeah. So rather than the system, you'd say, hey, what is in front of me? What has God called me to do? Mm. How can I make a difference in the lives of the men that I talk to today? Yeah, that's right. Um, I love to kōrero, I love to talk. My wife says I, I, I talk too much. But like I shared before, when you live with four women, you don't get to talk a lot. Yeah. Um, but I think if you have a passion that's so strong and that God wants you to, to speak it out, I think being obedient as I, I speak it out. Mm. And you know that compassion comes with wisdom. Learn to sit back and listen and learn to take a step forward. Um, the Church Roy Fellowship in Lower Hutt, the River of Life Centre. Mm. Yay! Um, big part of our life. My pastor, the eldership that I'm part of, it's just amazing people. The vision is the same. So um, I'm very lucky. Yeah, no, very good. Is it tough work emotionally? Is it heartbreaking at times? And if so, how do you deal with that personally? It can be tough work. Um, I think, well, I know, I... My team say to me, oh, life's a bit rough at the moment. Yeah. Because I'm not a pastor, I'm just a Kiwi bloke. Yeah. And I get grumpy. Mm. And then my team would say, Ench, you might need to take a, a couple of days off. And I take a couple of days off. Yeah. Um, to understand but to take a step back. I think uh, that would be familiar with most people mm. these days. Yes. Yeah. You've, you've shared about how important Jesus is in your life. Uh, is that something that you're able to talk about in the work situation? Is that something that you're free to share? Definitely, yes. Yes, <laughs> Good. definitely. Um, there, are, there are no rules or boundaries around faith. Yeah. Um, if there's an opportunity, I'll, I'll snatch that opportunity. If there's a door opening, I'll, I'll take that door. And, you know, I, I would ask, Lord, is this you? Are you here? <laughs> you know, are you holding this door open? And I'll step into that. And... Uh, um, Wow, there's so many things I could say right now. Has it ever got you into trouble, perhaps oversharing your faith? No. Okay. No. It has when I talk too long and they need to go back to <laughs> lockdown for their cells, but um, no. We were talking beforehand about the difference between yourself and the other, um, well, the men that you work with. They were once young boys like you were and perhaps had negative things spoken over their life. But they're also uh, young men that had hopes and dreams for the future. Is there hope in the inside? Do you encounter uh, people that you work with who have a belief that they can turn their lives around, live better versions of themselves for their families? Yes. Yes, there is. <laughs> Sorry, brother. Yes, Both there fun. is. And um, there is a sense of hopelessness but there is hope there. Yeah. Um, I've heard many stories of, of men opening up to God behind closed doors when they're locked down. Yeah. 
And I've heard stories of men walking out and becoming pastors wow. that have been involved in gangs, one in our own community in Lower Hutt. Um, amazing stories. So we know how infectious COVID has been. Yep. My prayer is that God will be infectious. So they would meet an eternal God on the inside. And then when they return to their whanos, their wahine, their, their mums, their wives, their children will say, hey, this is not the dad that left us. Yeah. What's changed? It can be tough for those who are leaving prison, uh, perhaps particularly if they've been in there for a while, reintegrating with society. And perhaps that's also true of COVID. We're, we're needing to mm. learn how to reintegrate with our communities. What do you think improves the odds of somebody who leaves prison wanting to make a fresh start? What improves the odds of them ending up making better choices, being a better version of themselves? What makes the difference? Well, support. Um, the support with the community probations, um, the support with Fano. Fano is a huge support. Yep. The support with uh, employment agencies. Uh, we have a, a thing in the jail we call RTW, Release to Work. Mm -hmm. So as they're released, uh, part of the integration plan may be getting them some, some work. At the moment, it's a good field because yep. there's a lot of work out there. Um, I guess from the perspective of our, our men incarcerated, it's the want. Mm. Do I want to get out there? Because while they've been with us, they don't have the freedom or the flexibility to, to have what they have out here. Yeah. And, and it, that's where the hard work starts. Mm. There's opportunities, but do you find that people are being given the opportunities? As a society, we're perhaps too reluctant to extend forgiveness, uh, to, uh, to open up our lives to people that we don't know, that we don't trust. Is it difficult for guys to... Um, to turn over that new leaf and be accepted by the society that they're stepping back into? I think so. I, I, I really do think so, because um, the men that I've had work with me and transitioned out into employment, part of the kōrero is that I say, you need to be the first there, the last one to leave. Yep. You need to, when you make the boss a, a cup of tea, make sure you make him the best cup of tea, because you had to prove yourself more yep. than anyone else. And... Um, from there, our life will just continue, I guess. But support is huge. Um, I would struggle to get through my own life, Andrew, without yeah. support. Yeah. No, that's true. I know that statistically there'll be people watching this who have been involved with the prison system at some stage of their life. What's the best advice that you would give them in terms of leaving prison and adjusting back to life within their families? That's a big question. Mm. That's actually huge. So I'm trying to fit a square peg in a round hole here. Well, say there's a situation, there's somebody that you've been working with, you've seen them work hard, they've been improving, they've shared with you their hopes of, of not wanting to blow it this time. Mm. You know this is hopefully the last day you're going to see them. In that situation, what would you say to encourage that person? I think for me, and to be honest, um, I, I like to meet with them before they're going out. Yep. Um, I like to love on them. And my way to love on someone is lay hands and pray. Mm -hmm. I like to speak destiny into them and work with the external agencies because once they leave the jail system, they're in the hands of someone else. Yep. But we still have a link and there are agencies and there's probations outside. And if I can get a link with them to say, what's a support mechanism around this young man? Because um, unfortunately, too often, this young person returns, or yeah, this yeah. person returns back yeah. into our society. I was, was going to say, this, is, this must be heartbreaking. Recidivism rates, uh, people who aren't going to make it, perhaps not the first time, must be heartbreaking for you to see guys that you've said goodbye to, that you've prayed a blessing over, they're back again. Um, yeah, I guess so. But it's about starting again. So um, I'm not worried about what happened. Mm -hmm. Let's just start again. And with a deep breath, and we'll move forward. Um, in fact, a lot of the guys that come back inside, um, they don't want to come and see me. Because, mm. you know, there's some, they're embarrassed, they're ashamed yeah. and stuff like that. Um, I'll, if I can, I'll make my way go and see them and speak with them and, you know, and we just start again. Mm. I mean, the work you're doing is obviously making a difference in the lives that you're able to connect with. But 
What is the difference that you would like to see in the lives of the people that you work with? Wow, that's a, that's a curly one, eh? Or to ask it another way, um, what do you pray for will be the legacy of the work that you do in the lives of these people? Um, Andrew, in my prayer is um, for the doors to open. My prayer is, Lord, Father, thank you for the door that opened because I know the door that you opened, no man can close. And the door that you close, Lord, no man can open. I pray for destiny over these men. I pray for their wives and their whānau. I pray for the community that they will be impacted. So, and I, I pray for the schools and all that around where they're coming into. And I pray for God's favour. And I pray for a, a sense of joy and peace and hope and love and salvation and glory and honour mm. and on and on and on. Um, we're not determined by the now, we're determined by the where to from here. Mm. We're talking at the beginning about how one individual, I think it was your woodwork teacher at high school, mm. decided what your future was going to be like. You pushed back against that and you said, no, that's not going to be my story. And that, in some ways, gave you the motivation that you needed to prove him wrong. Yeah. For, uh, for young people that are in that space, they go left or they go right. We've talked also about the lack of male role models and how for a lot of these young people they don't have fathers in their life. There's a big difference between mm. being a father and being a dad, isn't there? Amen. That's right. Well, I, I just didn't have a, a dad. I had a, I had a role model. Yeah. I had someone that believed in me. I had someone that spoke over me. I had someone that spoke into me. I had someone that showed me what love looked like. And, um, and I could have sat there and, and cried my eyes out and had a suki lala. But I was determined um, to actually prove him wrong. Yeah. And I went away and I, I did a course and I topped my class and I did my trade cert and I did all these papers and my hope was to return to the school with these documents and rub it in his face. However, the faith of me was, was determined not to do that. Mm. Actually, I look at him and say, thank you. Thank you for those words spoken into my life. Mm. You know, those words of negativity, I turn around to positivity, you know. You're the father of three daughters, but in some ways you're also the father to so many broken uh, men as well. Is that part of the role that God has called you to do, to restore hope and faith to the, to the fatherless in, in the prison where you work? I believe so. Um, Andrew, just not the fathers in the prison, but the fathers in our community. Mm. Um, I ran a, a, a men's group in our church, mm -hmm. and we called it Bro Group, Boys Reaching Out. Yeah. And we run, run it for many years. And the legacy was to enhance these men to go and make another group. Mm. Um, yeah. And thank you so much for taking the time to, thank you. to share what uh, God has called you to do today. Taking... The, the light of God shining it in some very dark places and bringing hope to those who desperately need it. We certainly mm. pray blessings upon the work that you do and on your family as well. Kia ora, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you, kia ora. And uh, thank you for taking the time to watch this as well. If you'd like to find out more about the work that Promise Keepers is doing, PK Men's Ministry, their website address is promisekeepers.nz. Thank you.